Five years ago, there was just one computer. It filled a room and cost, in today's money, $3 million. It had less power than a modern pocket calculator. Yet people at the time thought America would only ever need six such machines. Join us as we tell the remarkable story of a machine that changed the world. It changed the world of politics. Univac is going to try to predict the winner for us. Have you got a prediction for us, Univac? It changed the world of business. It got smaller, cheaper, and better, faster than any technology in history. If the auto industry had moved at the same speed as our industry, uh, your car today would uh, cruise comfortably at a million miles an hour, probably get a half a million miles per gallon of gasoline. But it would be cheaper to throw away your, your Rolls Royce and buy a new one than to park it downtown for the evening. Some people became very rich, like Steve Jobs and Stephen Wozniak, who started Apple Computer, the fastest growing company in history. Millions of computers were made. Some hated them. Others loved them, but nobody could ignore them. Join us on a journey of discovery inside a strange new machine. We meet the people who use it and the programmers who write its instructions. In just 45 years, the computer has permeated almost every aspect of modern life. The machine that changed the world, next. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. Five thousand years ago, mankind invented writing, a way to record and communicate ideas. These simple marks on clay and paper changed the world, becoming the cornerstone of our intellectual and commercial lives. Today we may be witnessing the emergence of a new medium, whose influence may one day rival that of writing. These are the electronic markings inside a computer. The patterns they form represent thoughts, concepts, sounds, and pictures. A modern computer fits on a desk is affordable and simple enough for a child to play on. But what to a child is a computer game is to the computer just patterns of voltages. Today, we take it for granted that such patterns can help architects to draw, scientists to model complex phenomena, musicians to compose.
and even aid classical scholars to search the literature of the past. Yet a machine with such powers of transformation is unlike any machine in history. Most machines will do only one thing. Every so often, someone tries to build an automobile that turns itself into an airplane. You see it all the time, and they don't work. They can be made to work, sort of, but a good automobile is not a good airplane, and a good airplane is not a good automobile. So when I think of the term universal machine, I feel like, well, is that what a computer is? And I, I suppose, in a sense, yes, it is, only it's, it's deadly serious that uh, a computer does have this kind of ability to transform itself into different things. A very good example is your standard personal computer, which you can use for engineering drawings, you can use it for mathematics, you can use it for word processing, you can use it to sort uh, names and addresses, all kinds of activities. It's the same computer. And the person who buys it decides, well, I want to use it for this, I want to use it for that. My daughter uses a computer for drawing. I use the same machine for writing books something like that, and it's, it's fine. There's no problem. In fact, it does a wonderful job at all of those things. Due to this versatility, today computers control the way the world works, from the billions of dollars which fly back and forth across the globe each day, to the millions of goods in our shops. Tiny computers can be found in everything from cars to household appliances. But computers don't just do things like other machines. They manipulate ideas. Computers conjure up artificial universes and even allow people to experience them from the inside, exploring a new molecule or walking through an unbuilt building. Computers embody a level of abstraction that makes them very much like minds, or rather that makes them mind-like. And that is to say, machines, or computers, manipulate not reality, but representations of reality. And it seems that that is, has a very close affinity with the way minds and consciousness works. The mind manipulates processes, images, ideas, notions. Exactly how it does that is, of course, not yet known. But there seems to be a strong uh, kindred relationship between the manner in which computers process information and the analogy that that has with the way minds and thinking and consciousness seem to work. So they have a very special place because they're the closest we have to a mind-like machine that we have yet had. Computers perform tasks which in humans require intelligence, such as chess or playing the organ. It is ironic that this most versatile of machines was invented to do one thing only, something humans did very slowly and inaccurately arithmetic. Divide the circumference of a circle by its diameter and you get pi, a number which never ends. A modern desktop computer can calculate the decimal expansion of pi to any number of places. To do it to 707 takes just seven seconds. Remarkably, this same task took an English school teacher named William Shanks 28 years of his life back in the 19th century. At night, Shanks would toil at the long calculations, which got harder the further he went. Tragically, he made a mistake at the 528th place, and so the last few years of his efforts were in vain. In Shank's day, the word computer referred not to a machine, but to a person who calculated. It was a tiring and unpleasant task, the mental equivalent of hard labor. The few aids available to such a computer, like the slide rule, were not very accurate. So mainly, he relied on tables books full of them with ready-worked multiplications, squares and cubes, and shortcuts like logarithms. And inevitably, he made mistakes. Typically, if the computer wanted to perform a multiplication, at first he would take the number, he would need to look up the logarithm. He would then copy that out from the table onto a piece of paper. 
He would then look for his second number, look it up in the table, copy it out, again transferring it onto paper. He would then perform an addition. He would add the two numbers and then refer for yet a third time into the table to look up the antilogarithm, the reverse of this process, and then copy the result down again. There is every opportunity for error in every stage of that operation. And even if the human computer didn't make a mistake, the tables he used might be riddled with errors, since they too were prepared by computers. When new sets of tables were produced, mistakes were always found. Such errors became an obsession with the Victorian mathematician Charles Babbage. When he ordered new tables to be calculated, he had the figures done twice by two independent human computers and checked one against the other. The Astronomical Society had appointed a committee to prepare certain tables. We had decided on the proper formulae and had put them in the hands of two computers for calculation. We met one evening for the purpose of comparing the calculated results. 58, 54. Yes. 63, 18, 55. Correct. 67, 38, 45. Uh, sorry, I've got uh, 61, 38, 45. Mm. Found it. It's an uh, error on mine. <laughs> right. Uh, 67, 38, 45. Finding many discordances, I expressed to my friend the wish that we could calculate by steam, to which he assented as within the bounds of possibility. age had seen machines taking over all kinds of physical tasks. If, Babbage reasoned, machines could carry out physical tasks, why couldn't they do mental work as well? The Industrial Revolution was built on numbers. Developments in civil and industrial engineering relied on accurate calculations. So did navigation. The volume of traffic was building up between Europe and the newly independent America. There were reports of ships running aground because of faulty navigational tables. So Charles Babbage designed a calculating machine and built just this small section. It's set up at the moment to produce a sequence of squares simply by turning a handle. Reading vertically, 9 is 3 squared, 4 squared is 16. Five squared is 25, and so on. Babbage called it a difference engine because the wheels and shafts added by a technique called the method of differences, which was comparatively easy to mechanize. To avoid printer's errors, the full machine would also print out the answers. Recognizing the national importance of accurate tables, the government put up the money to pay for development. But Babbage never completed his engine, partly because he was a poor manager, but mainly because he'd had a better idea. The difference engine could only do one thing, calculate by the method of differences. How much better, Babbage thought, to build a machine capable of doing many different things. With that single thought, Charles Babbage had hit upon the fundamental concept of the computer 150 years ago. This particular piece was under construction at the time of Babbage's death. It is a small experimental piece um, that is all, in fact, of the engine that was ever, ever uh, completed. Uh, the largest design of this kind that Babbage uh, devised would, in fact, be in the size of a small steam locomotive. The machine is revolutionary in many respects. It has much in common with modern digital computers, which is what is quite extraordinary given the time in which it was devised. The mill, which is what we would now call the central processing unit, the place that the machine operated on information, is quite separate from what we would now call memory, what Babbage called the store. The separation of store and mill is a feature of, of the subsequent electronic developments. Perhaps the most revolutionary feature of the whole machine is the fact that it's programmable. It's a general purpose programmable machine. And Babbage used punch cards to program the machine. Babbage got the idea of using punched cards from the textile industry. 
the French silk weaver Jacquard had used punch cards to control a loom. The pattern of holes in each successive card controlled the position of steel rods, which in turn determined which threads of the warp should be lifted above the shuttle and which should remain below. Different sequences of punch cards produced different patterns. Jacquard even had a set of cards which wove his own portrait. But whereas silk weaving was all Jacquard's loom would do, Babbage planned to use the cards to get his analytical engine, as he called it, to do a limitless number of different computations. Throughout history, machines had been defined in terms of what they did, but Babbage was proposing a machine whose purpose would be up to the user. That, I think, was a real profound difference in the way people thought of machines, because for the first time in history, you had someone designing a machine who didn't really think as he was designing it, all of the different ways that it could be used, uh, what it was good for. It was good for anything, and he would worry about that later on, but for the moment he would concentrate on getting the machine to work in a very general sort of way, and then having the specific uses attended to later. What we nowadays call software was really born in that moment when someone thought that you could separate out those two functions of a machine. Babbage left hundreds of drawings of the machine's hardware, its wheels and shafts. But what we know of the software, of how the analytical engine would be used, comes mainly from one of the most romantic figures in the history of the computer. Ada, Countess of Lovelace, was Lord Byron's daughter. At a party at Babbage's house, she saw the test piece of his first machine, and she was captivated. She enrolled herself as Babbage's interpreter to the world at large. This remarkable lady gave Babbage her enthusiastic support, and 150 years ago, the pair carried on a long correspondence probing the limits of computers. Because her published notes on the analytical engine contain detailed programs, Ada has been called the first computer programmer. But despite Ada's help and encouragement, Babbage failed to win backing for his idea. People had understood when he wanted to build a machine to calculate tables, but not this vague, grandiose plan. So Babbage died a disappointed and embittered man. His dream of a general purpose programmable computer vanished for a hundred years. By the end of that hundred years, technical development had transformed the classic single-purpose machine. But in an age of automobiles, trains, and planes, computing had changed very little. Adding machines were now available to help with individual operations like multiplication and addition. But computing was still a tedious task. Babbage's idea that the entire activity could be taken over by an error-free machine had made no progress at all. If you look at a dictionary published before the war, you find that computer is defined as a person, specifically a person employed to make calculations in an observatory or in surveying or in other related fields. During about a 10-year period from about 1935 to 1945, that definition changed. And if you look at a more recent dictionary, you see how that change is reflected by the current definition, which is a machine or any of several devices for making rapid calculations, an automatic electronic machine for performing simple and complex calculations. 
That definition changed from a person to a machine in about a 10 year period from 1935 to 1945. The first moves toward changing the meaning of the word computer took place here, in Berlin in the early 1930s. A young engineering student, Konrad Zusa, took the first steps toward building a computer. He had a limited objective at first. It was simply to avoid hard work. Yeah, that is wohl clear that a young man who gerne andere Dinge treibt, nicht nur Well, a young person clearly has better things to do than study and calculate. A civil engineer has other ideas in his head than just calculating, like plans for building bridges. And the calculations involved are not much fun. You could say that I was too lazy to calculate, and so I invented the computer. As he thought about building a computer, Zusa realized he needed a completely new approach to engineering design. Most machines, including the airplanes that Zusa was working on at the time, are built of a few basic subsystems, like the power plant, the hydraulic system, wing assemblies, and so on. Each system has a structure completely different from all the others, and once they are assembled, the purpose of the machine is determined. No amount of juggling of systems would turn these planes into cars. But a computing machine would need to be adaptable, like the human it sought to replace. The human computer used simple components, just ten numbers and a few signs. By moving them about and arranging them in different ways, she could perform a huge range of tasks in arithmetic, from stress analysis to calculating the positions of stars. Zusa reasoned that for a computer to vary its role to the same degree, it had to be based on a simple element, an element which could be easily replicated and then combined in different ways to produce different outcomes. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. The telephone industry used such a component, called the electric relay, a simple, on-off switch. Zusa realized he could build his flexible arithmetic machine out of relays, provided his machine counted in an obscure system called the binary system, which has only two numbers, zero and one. Probably because we have ten fingers, almost all human societies count in tens. It's so ingrained it seems to be the only natural way to count, but there are many other ways. <laughs> Instead of the ten digits we use, the binary system uses only two, zero, and one. Remarkably, these two digits can do as much as ten. The advantage of having only two digits is that they can be represented very simply by a switch. A switch in the on position equals one. One in the off position, a zero. Binary numbers really came about from an engineering standpoint. Because to an engineer, nothing is simpler than a switch that has basically two positions on and off. Compare that to the decimal calculators and the machines that Babbage tried to build, which had 10 positions, and you, you come away with an instant regard for the elegance and the simplicity of what later became the, called the binary system, but to an engineer it was just a simple, let's build the simplest element we can. What is that? It's a switch that's either on or off. Arithmetic could thus be carried out by circuits of electrical switches. Binary numbers, zeros and ones, could be added and subtracted. But to add just two binary numbers, one and one, it takes four relays. So Zusa realized that to do significant arithmetic, his computer would need hundreds of switches. Zusa's experimental machines filled the family's front room. They looked crude, 
But using his parents and university friends as labor, Zeus has solved most of the basic design problems. In 1939, he was the world's leading computer designer. Zeus's dreams were interrupted by the outbreak of the Second World War, a war which would change the computer from a small private venture into a large government-funded enterprise. He was drafted into the army and served for six months before he was discharged when it was realized he could do more for the war effort as an engineer than as a soldier. With the help of military funding, Zeus had completed two more computers using telephone relays. And to program them, he ingeniously got around wartime shortages by punching his program into rolls of discarded movie film. By the end of 1941, Zusa had succeeded in building the machine which Babbage had dreamed of 100 years before. He had a programmable general purpose computer, and time would prove that the structure he chose and the use of binary arithmetic were the right solutions. But the relays meant that his machine was still too slow to be very useful. It took three to five seconds to perform a multiplication. There was a faster switch available. The vacuum tube was the foundation of the new electronics industry. Vacuum tubes were most commonly used in radios where they acted as amplifiers. But they could be used equally well as lightning fast switches. One of the friends who had helped Zeus build his first machine Helmut Schreier believed that the future of computers was electronic. He came to my workshop and said, you ought to do this with vacuum tubes. I thought he was joking at first, but we thought about it. And the idea that you would be able to calculate 1,000 times faster was magic. In an electromagnetic relay, the switching is done physically by a piece of metal that must move from one set of contacts to another. In a vacuum tube, the switching is done by electrons, which for all our purposes can be considered to have no mass at all, no inertia. You can switch them very rapidly simply by turning on or off another current. That in practice means that you get switching speeds around 1,000 to 2,000 times faster than the best relays. Excited by the prospect of a fantastically fast machine based on vacuum tubes, the two young men laid their plans. They calculated that working together, it would take them two years to build an electronic computer. But when in 1941 they put in a request for funding, the German high command turned them down. Hitler had decided that no long-term projects should be undertaken. The war, he said, would be won in much less than two years. At that time, it seemed obvious that two years was too long. So nothing became of electronic development in Germany. Zeus's dream was shattered. His great achievements would not be known until long after the war. The future of computing would indeed be electronic, but it would be realized elsewhere. Across the Atlantic, America had entered the war, and military planners foresaw a big problem. The supply of the latest weapons to the Allied forces was threatened by, of all things, a shortage of human computers. To aim a gun that fired over the visible horizon, gunners depended on firing tables, which told them what angle to set for different weather conditions. Factors like winds and temperature radically affected where a shell would land for a given barrel angle. The raw data for the tables came from test firings. At the U.S. Army Proving Ground at Aberdeen, Maryland, much of this work was taken over by women to free men for the fighting front. This raw data was turned into firing tables by a computing group at the University of Pennsylvania. Among the computers there was Kay Mockley. To do just one trajectory, at one particular angle, usually took somewhere between 30 and 40 hours of calculation on this desk calculator. 
and these trajectories when they were after they were done were going to be incorporated in a firing table and one needed about 1800 of these trajectories to prepare one firing table so there was a tremendous job load there at this rate it took a human computer about four years to do one set of firing tables the situation was hopeless Captain Herman Goldstein, the man responsible for getting the job done, was desperate. We were getting farther behind all the time, so it became clear to me that we had to do something to break this bottleneck, and hiring of uh, girls as human computers was never going to fill the gap. And so I was very much on the lookout for mechanical means of solving the problem. At the nearby Moore School of Electrical Engineering, two visionaries thought they had the answer. John Mockley, a physicist, and a talented 23-year-old engineer, J. Presper Eckert, wanted to build an electronic computer. Their design was awesome, proposing to use some 18,000 vacuum tubes to do the lightning-fast arithmetic. The experts were scornful. It was a well-known fact that vacuum tubes were unreliable. They tended to burn out. One authoritative estimate was that a machine with 18,000 tubes would break down about every five seconds. But the army was so desperate, they agreed to fund the project. This thing had more than 100 times as many tubes in it as anything else had, several hundred times as many tubes as anything else had. And we had decided very early in the game that the only way that this would be manageable would be if we made it in modular sections, which plugged in which meant repair could be done by not pulling out a tube if something was wrong, but by pulling out a section that didn't work and plugging in a new spare. But in addition to that, we went to great efforts to, to design the circuits with a set of mathematical rules which ensured that all the parts could be out of tolerance by the maximum expected amounts and still work. We called this worst, worst design, meaning if everything was in the worst, worst way, it would still work. It's the kind of thing these days, that on a much bigger scale, is done in the space program, where, where they go to all kinds of extremes to try to avoid failures. Because we wanted this thing to work. If we built this huge thing and it didn't work, it would just set back progress instead of setting it forward. It filled a room 50 feet by 30 feet. As well as its 18,000 tubes, it had tens of thousands of electrical components and half a million soldered joints. They called their creation ENIAC, for electronic numerical integrator and computer, and it could perform 5,000 additions every second. Are people becoming obsolete? The giant electronic brain has started cogitating at the University of Pennsylvania. It's made of vacuum tubes, like your radio, and it can add up a column of figures a yard long in a second. It's the world's first electronic computer. Right now, it's solving mathematical problems for the U.S. Army, but who knows, someday a machine like this may check up on your income tax. ENIAC created myths. Every fictional computer thereafter would have flashing lights. In fact, the bright lights made from ping pong balls were specially fitted for the publicity film. Arthur Burks, a member of the engineering team, masterminded the machine's public debut. In the public demonstration of the ENIAC, we computed the trajectory of a shell that took 30 seconds to reach its target. ENIAC computed the trajectory in only 20 seconds, faster than the shell itself traveled. ENIAC was seen as a triumph by its army sponsors, even though it was too late to help win the war. It mattered that the ENIAC wasn't done before the end of the war in some sense, because it would have helped to have done a lot of other things with it. But uh, it was, its great importance lay in starting the computer revolution anyway, and not in doing firing and bombing tables. So in a sense, it didn't matter when it got done. To me, the most remarkable thing about the ENIAC was that its designers had the audacity to put 18,000 vacuum tubes into one system and make it work. And I think that was the real tough nut to crack because you had to build something that was very, very complex that had many more vacuum tubes 
or elements than anything else that people had previously done and make it work. And that was very hard to do. And for them to, to, to first of all propose doing it and then pull it off, I think was remarkable. And it really shattered the whole feeling around uh, ever since Babbage's day that this thing would never happen. It just shattered through that because it immediately, as soon as it was finished, it immediately began doing very useful work and people began lining up trying to get some time on it. The Coming of Peace released an army of technically trained men and women from military work. The skills they had used on wartime projects like radar could now be turned to the new field of electronic engineering, computer development. And there was still much to be done. The Moore School had only laid the groundwork. ENIAC's remarkable speed had convinced people of the value of electronic computing. But much of this benefit was lost when the engineers tried to change the program. A modern desktop computer has many times ENIAC's power, but the important difference lies in the way it's programmed. Today, program instructions are written in a stream of electronic pulses on a floppy disk. Load a program into the computer's memory and it quickly becomes a spreadsheet. Another program plays a chess game. Yet another, a calculus problem. But the ENIAC could not store its program inside, and so was programmed not with floppy disks, but by people. Reprogramming the ENIAC meant rewiring it. This job involved individually setting up to 6,000 switches and then replugging the hundreds of cables connecting different parts of the machine. There were no manuals at all in those days. They had not yet been written. Some excellent ones were written later, but at that time there was nothing. There was nothing available to us at all except the wiring diagrams of each unit. So some of the professors at Penn helped us to learn how to even read the wiring diagrams. And we learned how each accumulator worked from the back, how the multiplier worked, what each tube did. These switches that we turned in the front of the machine would then activate or deactivate the various tubes in the back. In a sense, you were literally rebuilding the machine for each problem that you wanted to solve. And uh, during that time, the machine, a very expensive machine, would be sitting there idle, not doing anything useful. Sometimes this could take days. As a result, people came to the notion that future computers would be electronic like the ENIAC but they would also have their instructions stored in the memory along with the data. That way, when you wanted to change over from one program to another, you simply would load in a new set of instructions into the memory and then let the computer do the rest. This idea had already occurred to ENIAC's designers, but the Army was anxious to have their machine as soon as possible. By the time I had we had frozen the, uh, the design. Uh, we were all completely dissatisfied with it. We had thought of better ways of doing everything that we were doing in it. But here again, the philosophy of it, you're not gonna make any progress if you don't stop fooling around and don't get on with the show, had to take precedence. The Moore School team knew how they should have built ENIAC and how they would do it next time. This landmark report became the theoretical blueprint for all future computers. It bore the name of John von Neumann, America's most distinguished mathematician, who had joined the project as ENIAC neared completion. But the Moore School would lose the race to build the first complete computer because within months, Eckert and Mockley had left. The two inventors who saw commercial possibilities in computers had applied for a patent on the ENIAC. This brought them into conflict with a new research officer at the university who demanded that Eckert and Mockley give up their rights to the invention. We didn't want to do this. And he told us, well, in that case, he'd have to accept our resignation in a month if we didn't do it. And we said, well, there's no use in waiting a month. We're not going to change our minds. So he said, well, take the month anyway. At the end of a month, he came back and said, take a week. And we said it's the same answer. Well, why wait the week? He said, oh, I take the week. He came back in a week and said, I'll give me another day. And we, so we waited the week, the, the month, the week and the day and left. 
they did something most people thought a little crazy. They started the first commercial computer company. Eckert and Mockley believed there was money to be made building and selling computers. But their path would not be an easy one, and it would be many years before the pair delivered their first commercial computer. So it was a British radar engineer, Freddie Williams, who designed the first working computer with a stored program. He ran it in July 1948. Manchester University, where anyone who urgently wishes to know whether 2 to the power of 127 minus 1 is a prime number or not, can be given the answer by an electronic brain in 25 minutes instead of by a human brain in six months. Impressed by the speed of the machine, many people were still skeptical about its general usefulness. Just who would want to use these marbles? What would they use them for? And how easy would they be to operate? When computers had been people, scientists had needed them. Could scientists be induced to use these forbidding electronic machines instead? Later, an automatic keyboard will type the answer. At Cambridge University, a young physicist named Morris Wilkes believed that if computers were made as friendly as possible, scientists would become interested. The machine he built was called the EDSAC. When we were building the machine, people didn't know very much about it, and I think they thought we were perhaps a little crazy. As soon as the thing began to work, we invited... Uh, people from other departments to come in and try their hand, in particular graduate students. The graduate students managed to get useful results, they showed them to their research supervisors, and their research supervisors then began to say computers were important, and after a few years it was everybody in the university was saying computers were important. Even though such computers could do the work of 10,000 human computers with calculators, scientists had no problem keeping them fully occupied. As scientists became familiar with the machine, they discovered that computers opened undreamed of possibilities. New sciences, like radio astronomy, developed as they never could have without computers to handle the masses of data. In 1950, most scientists, if asked to predict the future of computers 45 years hence, might well have imagined something like today's supercomputers. The direct descendants of the ENIAC, they crunch numbers at enormous speeds, helping scientists understand everything from meteorology to chemistry. But few would have imagined that such exotic machines would form a tiny fraction of the world's computers. Few could have predicted that most computers would be used by ordinary people for things having nothing to do with numbers. But 40 years ago, there were those who sensed there was more to these electronic brains and wondered what else they might be made to do. One of the most brilliant thinkers of the day, a young mathematician named Alan Turing, felt that most scientists had missed the point about computers. Computers had an almost limitless potential. To use computers like this one just for arithmetic was a terrible waste. It was designed in 1946, which is a long time ago. But this was where computers started, electronic computers started. This is one of the first stored program computers. It was designed by a man called Alan Turing who was in fact a British mathematician who was involved in cracking codes in the war, in the Second World War, cracking the German codes, yes, in the war. Turing's ideas on computers went back even further than the war. In 1936, he had published a paper on an abstruse mathematical problem. In this paper, written a full decade before computers were built, he wrote about computing machines, and demonstrated theoretically that one such machine could in principle do any logical task a human could do. Turing knew there was nothing special about arithmetic, 
It was just a step-by-step -step logical process which manipulated symbols according to certain rules. But so was code breaking. It took symbols, usually letters, and transformed them to try and unscramble a message. If manipulation of numbers could be carried out by machine, so could manipulation of letters. A few years later, in a top secret wartime project, so secret that its very existence was only revealed in 1970, Turing was recruited to the headquarters of the British code-breaking effort, based at Bletchley Park. The encoding methods used by the Germans in the Second World War relied on machines. Enigma, the best known, encoded the day-to-day -day traffic of the forces. This was Turing's main area of responsibility. But the most important of all the messages, including some from Hitler himself, could not be cracked by conventional strategies fast enough. These messages were scrambled on special devices like the Lorenz. The Lorenz had shifting wheels which altered the letters in a continuously changing manner, presenting a nightmare for the code breakers at Bletchley Park. Alan Turing worked out one of the logical strategies the code breakers used to attack it. But the task was hopeless. It was much too slow to be useful. So instead, they built an electronic machine to crack codes at electronic speed. Called Colossus because of its size, it was a partial embodiment of the sort of computing machine Turing had imagined. Colossus began operating in 1943, the same year work on ENIAC began. But where ENIAC's vacuum tubes did arithmetic, Colossus's circuits carried out the logical steps of a code breaker. Colossus was successful, continually breaking top secret messages, and it undoubtedly helped to win the war. But the whole project was so secret that not a word about it leaked out for more than 30 years. However, it demonstrated what Turing had always believed, that a computer was not simply an arithmetic machine. Because of the secrecy surrounding Colossus, Alan Turing's remarkable insight into what a computer was has only recently been recognized. A celebrated stage play, Breaking the Code, used Turing's words and writings to capture the personality and mannerisms of a brilliant eccentric who was light years ahead of his time. Those symbols could represent numbers or coded letters, even the moves of a chess game. And if chess, why not other human intellectual activities? To Turing and the few people he could convince, the possibilities seemed unlimited. Turing had this extraordinary, uh, almost uh, unique obsession with looking at a problem as though it was the first time that anybody in the world had ever looked at that problem and taking it completely fresh. There was a small group of us who came very much under his spell in terms of the vision that he had for what would be possible after the war to develop uh, computing machines, which in itself was an amazing idea, but not just for numerical calculations, but for symbolic non-numerical uh, calculations which could simulate the processes of, of logical human thought and above all of machine learning. But unfortunately for Turing, the response of young colleagues like Donald Mickey was not typical. The establishment didn't seem to get what Turing was talking about. Having devoted great effort to designing his ace, he realized it would never be used as he had hoped. He wanted to simulate human thought, but the machine was destined to spend all its time performing scientific calculations. When it became entangled in bureaucracy, he left in disgust. Moving to Manchester University, he had a chance to try out a few of his ideas for non-mathematical projects. It was a piece of equipment designed by Turing himself that allowed the Manchester computer to try its hand at creative word processing. Turing increasingly began to draw parallels between the computer and the human brain. It was on this subject that he chose to speak when he went to talk to the boys at his old prep school, Sherburn. And the logic of a computer is really very simple. All it does 
He used to read a list of instructions and then carries it out methodically. And the only thing you have to do is to write down exactly what you want done in a language the computer understands. This is what we call a program. Now, many people say that a computer can only do what it's been told to do. Well, it's true that we may start off that way, but it is only the start. A computer can be made to learn. Suppose, for example, it was set to play chess. Well, it could find out for itself, in the light of its own experience, which were winning and which were losing strategies, and then drop the losing ones. See, after a time, <laughs> he wouldn't know what instructions it was actually following. That would hardly be fair to say that we had instructed it what to do. That would be like crediting the masters with any originality shown by the pupils. The question that arises as to whether or not we would credit such a machine with intelligence. I would say that we must. In 1950, Turing proposed a test of machine intelligence which a computer would have to pass. Imagine you are in a room communicating via a keyboard with an entity elsewhere. Through question and answer, you have to decide whether you are communicating with a human being or a machine. He only gives you five minutes to put questions. And if at the end of uh, that five minutes, you're not more than 70% sure uh, that it's uh, really just a machine, then he said uh, it would be only fair to concede that uh, the machine possesses some intelligence. He's been misquoted. He didn't say that, then that shows that it's as intelligent as a human being. Um, he just said you would have to concede that it has some intelligence. And he believed that by the year 2000, uh, the kind of dialogue that he illustrates in that paper would be possible. In 1954, this remarkable genius committed suicide following a prosecution for homosexuality so he never saw which of his visions came true and which didn't. He never lived to see that Eckert and Mockley's far-fetched idea to start a computer business would end up launching an industry. Soon, offices full of clerks would be replaced by a single machine. He never lived to see how engineers were able to shrink the main circuitry of a computer and put it on a single chip you could fit on your hand, leading to computers that were so small and cheap they could be mass-produced. He never lived to see that one day computers would play chess better than all but the very best human players. And the computer would go on to do many other things that even Turing could not possibly have imagined. Today, children look back at the machines of Turing's time in astonishment. Computers are such common objects used for so many things that it is hard for them to understand that once all people did with them was compute. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information system's needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation.